Well, welcome to church, everybody. Oh, my gosh. Turn to your neighbor, give everybody a little knuckle bump, and let them know, I'm glad you're at church this morning. Come on, come on. Seward, welcome. Chapel, welcome. We're so excited that you're here. And of course, Monday evening, you're going to be seeing this as well, because in case you didn't notice, well, those of you who aren't in the room in Lincoln, you haven't noticed, but those of you who are, uh, we're preaching via video today. And the reason being, uh, Pastor Kerry and I are both in Jacksonville, Florida, preaching at Rise Church for our friends, Pastors Adam and Rebecca Peterson. And so, man, we are there with them. But we thought that it was so important on week two of this message series for us to be with you as well. So we're going to do a little bit of a hybrid today, okay? So I hope you're okay with that, us doing a little bit of a hybrid. Are you you okay with that? I knew you would be. I knew you would be. Hey, listen, don't forget to check in on social media, just letting people know that you're here because as you as you do, we make a donation on your behalf. But in addition to that, what happens is you let people on your friends list know that there is a church worth checking out. Come on, somebody. Let's keep inviting people and, uh, and bringing them with you, letting them know that there are seats available for them to be able to experience the presence of God, which is so stinking exciting. Speaking of invites, we've got these books available called Donkey Mission, okay? Pastor Matt uh, Keller talked about it a little bit last week, but we're using these as invites for people during this series, uh, and we're actually preaching all the messages right out of Pastor Matt Keller's book. So be sure to get one at either one of our locations. You can buy them for $5 per copy. Uh, we want you to have one, but of course we want you to use them as an invite to give to somebody else as well. So here we go. Let's jump into week two. Somebody say week two of this series that I'm talking about. What's the point? Again, taken from Pastor Matt Keller's book, Donkey Mission, which is based from the scripture, 1 Samuel chapter number nine, okay? Now, if you're new to Mercy City Church, I gotta say welcome. I'm so stinking glad that you're here, that you made it, that you're with us this weekend. I can't wait to meet you in person next week when Pastor Carrie and I are both back. But you gotta know that it's important that you're here because we believe that we're better together, okay? But we also believe that you're gonna be better because you're here and we're together as well. So it's mutual benefit for you visiting here today. But since you are new or maybe you're here and you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to catch up on this series by downloading the Mercy City Church app and you can go to our messages and it'll be right there for you. Okay, here we go. Today, somebody say today. I believe that God wants to specifically and intentionally speak to your heart individually as I preach this message that's called Dealing With Your Past. Come on, everybody. Let's lean in and pray as we think about dealing with our past. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for the wonderful opportunity we have today to be in your presence. We don't take it lightly, God. It's a big deal. So we pray that by the power of your spirit, you lead us and you guide us, that you show us Jesus like we never seen him before because we know it's upon revelation of who Jesus is that you will establish your church. So God, do in us, do through us today what only you can in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, everybody. Listen, turn to somebody and let them know, I'm glad you're here today for real, for real. I'm glad you're here today. I'm so stinking glad that you're here today. Let me ask you a question, everybody. Do you have, um, you know, one of those spaces in your house, like a door, for instance, that you leave closed all the time because you're fearful of what might be behind that door? You know, like maybe the closet that you throw everything in and you just slam the door shut and you're like, I'm not going to revisit this because I don't know what's living in that room. Of course you do. I think we I think we all do. For instance, in my house, it's every one of our kids' rooms. No matter where our kids live, on the other side of that door, it's a door that Pastor Carrie and I do not want to open because we do not know 
what's living in there. Actually, the only time we do go in our kids' rooms is just to make sure that our kids are still living, you know? I mean, it's that type of a situation. But something that I think is really interesting, especially in the Midwest, is that people have junk drawers. Are you guys familiar with the junk drawer? Okay, I think it's the weirdest thing ever that you have a junk drawer. We have one at our house. We've adopted this custom, and now we have a junk drawer. Junk drawers? Yeah, I, okay, I figured, I figured. I think it's so interesting that we create a specific space to place all of our junk in our homes. Like everything that doesn't have a place or doesn't fit somewhere, we bring it to this one place and we designate a space in our house. We carve out territory. We create space for our junk. And I think that it's so weird, especially at our house. Like I said, we've got so much junk packed in this one drawer that it's like you can't even open it, but when you do, like stuff gets stuck behind and you're like pulling the drawer and you're like have to stick your hand. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You gotta stick your hand in there and like kind of push the stuff down so you can slide the drawer out. And I don't know if you can, these hands are big, man. And so it just becomes really, really really difficult. What I've learned over the years is that obviously Pastor Kerry and I have some kind of aversion to throwing things away. Actually, I guess it's just me because (laughs) every once in a while Pastor Kerry will say, hey, listen, um, we're going to use this day to clean out the junk junk drawer. Literally, it does require us to designate a day to clean out this drawer. And so what we do is we go and we open the drawer and and of course she makes me do it because that's just kind of the way that we roll at our house. And and uh, so I'm taking all this stuff out and, and I'm looking at her and I'm saying, hey, what is this cord for? And she's like, I don't know. And I'm like, what's this ball for? I don't know. What are these bobby pins for? And she's like, I don't know. What is this battery for? I don't know. And I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, well, what do you want me to do? Because I'm just going to put it back in the drunk drawer. Junk, I keep saying drunk drawer. It's not a drunk drawer. We don't have any alcohol in there, I promise. It is a junk drawer. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, you guys are going to go home today and say, hey, Pastor Matt was, no, no, no. It's a junk drawer drawer, okay? And so I'm just going to put this stuff back in to the junk drawer, and I'm looking at her, and I want her to affirm the fact that I can put the stuff back in the drawer, but she's not a hoarder. Again, I think I might have a problem with this. She says, Matt, why don't you just throw it away? And I'm like, but what if we need it? What if we need the stuff that we're putting in the junk drawer? And I think that's like our lives Two, isn't it? She's looking at me saying, Matt, what's the point? And I'm saying, well, what if I need it? And all the while, the Lord's trying to teach me a lesson about dealing with some things that I don't actually need to be packing away in the midst of this. Again, you guys, we're in the middle of a four-week series based on this book, Donkey Mission, that talks about the life of Saul, who was sent by his father on what seemed to be a pointless mission. However, I think that Many of us realized last week that some of these pointless missions are connected to our greater mission, and it was encouraging that we might have something come from these things that seem so pointless. Today, specifically, I want to lean into and focus on one of these verses in 1 Samuel chapter 9, but in order to give us a more full picture of the context, I want to read four verses, and then we'll just focus in on one, okay? So you ready? All right, let's lean in, everybody. 1 Samuel chapter number 9, verse 1. The Bible says this, there was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of, and the son of, and the son of, of the son of, and they were all of the tribe of Benjamin, okay? His son Saul was the most handsome man in all of Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. One day, Kish's donkey strayed away, and he told Saul, take a servant with you and go look for one of the donkeys. So Saul took one of the servants, and he traveled through the hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalisha, and the area of Shalim. The entire land of Benjamin, but they could not find the donkeys 
anywhere. Okay, we're going to time out right there and kind of just settle in for today. Because on the surface, what we see are some details about these verses that don't seem like they really matter. It seems kind of insignificant. However, we need to know something when we read the Bible that there is no detail that is too small, no thing that is there by accident. It's actually all there on purpose. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to lock in on verse 4 for just a couple of minutes. And as we do, we lean in. I want us to remember that it's there on purpose. Let me say it's there on purpose. There are a lot of details in the course of these verses that, you know, I would probably consider, okay, maybe it's important, maybe it's not, but there's one detail in the midst of this, this, this portion of Scripture that I think is just really, really important, and it's not there, it's left out, and it's the name of the servant. I mean, this brother was low-key a hero, and his name did not even get put in the Scripture, but we got the names of the places that they traveled. The servant was not named, but they named the places where they traveled here to the country, hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalisha, the, the, la- the area of Shalim, and the land of Benjamin. And here's the deal. In Pastor Matt Keller's book, he goes into great detail on all of these four areas. But for the sake of time, I want to take a minute just to dive into specifically the land of Benjamin. And this is important because they go to the land of Benjamin But in verse 1, you'll remember, there was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the the tribe of Benjamin. Kish, who was Saul's father, was from Benjamin, which made Saul also a Benjamite. He was from the land or the area of Benjamin. This is where Saul was from. This is where his family line was from. He was probably familiar with some of the area, the territory. There were probably some memories that Saul had here. He had probably heard stories of what once took place in this land. I think it's interesting that Saul's donkey mission took him back through the place where he grew up, the place of his past. And that's what I want to talk to you about for just a couple of minutes here is... How our donkey missions, in order for them to get us to our greater mission, will oftentimes take us through a place of our past that many of us might want to shy shy away from. Because contrary to the way that many of us have been convinced to live our lives, when dealing with our past, avoiding the past is not the answer. So let me share with you four truths of dealing with your pasts so that we can get past our past and move forward into the future that God has for us. So four truths, here they are. Truth number one, it all matters. Let me say, it all matters. Listen, no detail is insignificant. No detail is too small. No detail, just like in the scripture, no detail is put there for no reason. Every single detail of your story matters, just like every single detail of the scripture matters. Your story is significant, every part of your story, including your past. Let me say it matters, because it matters to get you to the place where God is calling you. So in order for Saul to move forward into his future, he had to recognize and first deal with his past. Have you ever found yourself back in the old stomping grounds? That place where you grew up, the old home, the old neighborhood, the old elementary school. You ever been back there? Sure you have. We all have. Sometimes uh, we go back physically. Sometimes we go back emotionally. Sometimes we go back spiritually. But no matter how you go back, the part that matters is recognizing that you do actually go back. So whether it's been physically, emotionally, or spiritually, you need to know this, that the enemy's goal for us is to get us stuck in the process of navigating our past. He doesn't want us moving forward. He wants us spinning our wheels. God's process, God's goal is to process our past and bring hope and healing. Either way, you're still going to go through your past. The enemy has a goal for your past, but God also has a goal for your past. I remember when we first moved here to Lincoln, 
we were getting ready to meet at the, uh, start the church, and we were meeting in a middle school, and I remember the principal ran up to me one day before we launched, and she says, hey, Pastor Matt, Pastor Matt. I said, yes, you know, what can I do for you? And she said, I got a story to tell you. I spent time this weekend with one of your ex-girlfriends from high school. How many of y'all know that that was a bad day, Right? But here's what I had to realize, that my past was coming back, and here I was at the doorstep of my old stomping grounds, and I had a decision to make. Either I'm going to let the enemy cause me to want to avoid that, or I'm going to lean into it and realize, hey, I do have a past, and it all matters, and it all matters for the future and the place that God's taken me to. And so I leaned in, and I just shared the story. I said, oh, yeah, but I'm way different now. And I love this about 1 John chapter number 1. Verse 9 says this, but if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Listen to me. There's healing in confession. When you accept the things of your past, God's able to make it all matter for his glory. I'm telling you, there's healing through Jesus. Here's the second truth. After the first truth is it all matters, the second truth is this. The past matters. Well, yeah, Pastor Matt, you just said it all matters. Yeah, yeah, okay, but the past specifically matters. The past matters to our present. Whether you realize it or not, your past will affect your present. I believe, in fact, that in order for Saul's donkey mission to matter, God ordered his steps, taking him through this place of his past so that he can confront his past and move toward his future. I also believe that our paths have crisscrossed our past as well. And I think that they need to in order for us to move forward. Think about it. Has your past ever reared its head in your present? Of course it has. You gotten angry like your dad? You ever gotten depressed like your mom? You ever had financial struggles like your family? And you just feel like I'm stuck in my past. You ever experienced that familiar feeling or those undertones, those things that try to make you move backwards from your present? Yeah, it's your past rearing its ugly head. Here's what you got to know about your past is that it does matter in your present today. Things from our past must either be embraced or they must be excavated. But in order for us to do this work, we have to realize that our past matters in our present. Our past matters in our present. We cannot avoid it. We can't look beyond it. We've got to realize it matters today. And not just the bad things, but even the good things. What about the good things of faith? Maybe the good things of decision making. Maybe the fun that you have as a family. Maybe the gifts that you've been given to operate in life. Not just the bad things, the good things. You've got to recognize that your past matters for your present. And so you want to embrace the good things and you want to excavate the bad things. We want to stop being people who avoid our pasts. Because the past matters and they can't be avoided forever. Anything that we avoid from our past will ultimately compound in our lives today. Which is the third truth for dealing with our past is the compound effect. The compound effect. What we won't deal with will certainly compound in our lives. Every decision that we make to not deal with our past or to deal with something that comes up or shows itself in the present, whether we're ignoring it, whether we pretend that it doesn't exist, have you ever said, it's all good? That's simply you saying, I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist because it's not all good. It's not all good. You pretend it doesn't exist. Maybe you're afraid of it, ashamed of it, or you're just actively avoiding it. Not dealing with your past only allows it to become even more deeply rooted in your world, ultimately compounding the effect of it in our lives. What we don't allow the Lord to deal with now has the potential to derail us later. The enemy's goal is to use our past to knock us off 
the, 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 the path for our future. Can I say something hard to you? I'm going to say it with a smile on my face. How about that? It might not only be the enemy that's bringing up your past. It might also be God bringing it up so that he can heal you and move you forward into your future. Which brings us to the fourth and final truth. God wants to heal us. Let me say God wants to heal us. I believe today with all my heart that God desperately wants to heal us of our past. I believe that he wants us to excavate those things that are not from him. And he wants us to embrace those things that are from him. Because there's both good and bad in our past. We've got to realize that. We've got to recognize that. We've got to embrace that. And we've got to stop actively avoiding it. I believe that God wants to heal us from our past so that it can't hold us back from our future. The enemy knows that anything we refuse to deal with now, for whatever reason, can ultimately derail us then. Again, when it comes to our past, we must either embrace it or excavate it. And the enemy's goal is for us to compound the past problems in our lives. But God's got a goal for our past as well. The Father's heart is that we would be healed and that all of those things that aren't from him would be gone. Done. Healed. Complete. And whole. So these have been the four truths that we have to understand in order for us to move forward effectively, navigating the cluttered drawers of our lives. Why on earth, everybody, do we want to hold up something from our past and say, you know what, I might need it in my future. It's not serving any purpose. What's the point of it? If there's no point to it, let's move beyond it and let God heal us. God has no desire for us to hang on to the things just because we've always had them. You don't need to hold on to your past just because it's always been there. No, God wants you to heal from your past. So what do we do now? What do we do next? What are our action steps? There are actually three action steps that we're going to identify as we walk away today. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite our live communicators up right now to be able to, com- to communicate to you, to encourage you in what these action steps are. I believe that God is going to heal us and bring us past our past today. Come on, come on, what a word. Can we give it up for Pastor Matt? Come on, come on. But, but here's the good news. We don't, we don't just have to, to, to deal with truth. Uh, he set it up so well. What we get to do now is, it's one thing to know, hey, it all matters. Every detail of your life is significant. It's one thing to know that your past matters. It's one thing to know that there's a compound effect. Whatever it is that we don't deal with compounds. Has anyone ever experienced that? The things that you just kind of shove aside into the corner, thinking that, like, man, if I just don't deal with it, it will go away. I'm reminded of a time when I was about 16 years old, and I just refused to get an oil change in my car. And I thought that, like, the Lord would just, like, miraculously, like, lay his hand and fill my oil. No, I blew my engine, you know, what? (laughs) duh, right? Right? But some of us, that's our life. We're, we're refusing to deal with something, thinking that it's just going to go away. All the while, the, the noises are getting louder and louder and louder and louder. And we're ashamed. But the fourth truth, I think, is what gets us to our next steps, the fourth truth that God wants to heal us. So we're, we're somewhere in that space of navigating, but it brings us to the question, what do we do now? Like, I've acknowledged all of those things, but what do I do with it? And the first thing is this, and I'm going to say it a lot, and when I say it, what I'm referring to is not necessarily the good things of our past, but the things from our past that are holding us back. So what do we do when, what do we do? We first need to do this. We need to notice when it appears. I was blessed uh, when I was born with a great lack of self-awareness. Anyone else? I I remember there was a season of my life where I learned more about me from other people than I knew about myself, where they would consistently say, hey, Derek, uh, when you do that, this is how it makes me feel. Hey, Derek, when you do that, you make other people feel kind of alienated. And and I remember this season of dealing with this remarkable pain of realizing that there were a lot of things in my life that I wasn't aware of. 
And what it started was this consistent prayer that I pray in my life now of just, Lord, make me self-aware. Lord, make me self-aware. Why do I do what I do? Some of us go through life and we do things that we don't like doing, but we have, we've never taken the time to stop back and think, why am I doing that? We have a situation that arises at work and we react in a way that's over the top and all of a sudden we're embarrassed and we want to hide and we don't want to face anyone. But we never step back to ask, why do I react that way? We're dealing with pain and we never take a moment to, to ask, is the pain that I'm dealing with right now familiar to pain that I've dealt with in my past? Is this maybe from something in my past that I've just refused to deal with and now it's compounding? We need to notice when it appears. And if you're someone who's walking through life and maybe when I just said that I realized I had a lack of self-awareness, you started wondering, do I have self-awareness? Can I tell you if you're asking, you probably don't. As someone who uh, navigated that too, it's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Today you can start the process of asking the Lord, Lord, would you make me self-aware? Can I tell you, he'll do it. It might not feel good in the moment, but can I tell you, the Lord telling you in secret is a lot better than someone telling you in public. Lord, make me self-aware. We have to notice when it appears. We need to notice when our past appears. And here's the thing, when it begins to, number two is this, ask for help with it. This is where a lot of us get stuck. Now I'm self-aware, but now I've just got to deal with it. No, 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 no. The Bible says this in James 5, 16. It says, confess therefore your faults to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Forgiveness happens when we bring something to the Lord. Healing happens when we bring it to a brother or sister. It goes on to say this, the earnest prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it produces wonderful results. Notice the key, a righteous person. You don't bring your past to anybody and everybody. You bring your past to someone who's running after Jesus at the same rate or a greater rate than you are because that's where power is. The earnest prayer of a righteous person produces powerful results. It's effective. Some of us have been wondering why our, our, our efforts to deal with our past have been ineffective because we're not bringing it to the right place. We're not bringing it to the right relationships. We have so many opportunities for us to be in relationship here at Mercy City, whether it be a city group, a freedom group. Come on, if you're not in a freedom group, can I encourage you? If, there, if there's anything that you ever take part of outside of a Sunday morning in Mercy City Church, let it be a freedom group so that we can deal with the things of our past, so that we can bring it to someone, a righteous person, someone running after Jesus, and we can deal with it. Ask for help with it. I remember a time that Pastor Matt sent me to a storage unit that we used to have because we used to be portable, and a lot of things accumulated in this storage unit. And Derek, he said, kind of, Derek, sort through this a little bit. And I went through there. I was the wrong person to ask. When it comes to organizing things, I am not a righteous person, let me tell you. But what did we do? We got our whole team in there. And eventually a couple people who knew what to do began to say, hey, put this in this pile, put this in this pile, put this in this pile, put this in this pile. I'm really good at sorting if someone tells me what to sort. But someone can do that with us in our heart. Hey, here are the contents of my heart. What do I need to keep? But here's the real question, what do I need to get rid of? Which is the third thing, we need to get rid of it. There are some things in our heart that have no reason to be taking up space in our heart anymore. Like Pastor Matt said, when he begins to open that junk drawer and you, you can't quite put your hand in it, we need to get some of that stuff out and not just organize it in a neat way, we need to throw it away. And what happens when we throw it away? It begins to open up space in our heart. And here's the good news. God will fill any space that you open up for. So I wonder if you'd stand on your feet with me as we're closing. We need to notice when it appears. We need to ask for help with it. But here's the real thing, we need to get rid of it. And this isn't one of those messages that I'm gonna say, hey, go home and stew on it. Go home and think about it. Go home and pray about it. Because here's the thing. As we've been talking about this, there are things that have popped into your mind already, I promise you. And the beautiful thing about following Jesus in a moment like this, I, I think about when I was in 
middle school, high school science classes. I don't remember a single thing that I learned. Can I be honest with you? But I remember almost every experiment that we ever did. I remember the experiment when all the gas bubbles were coming out of this big container and the, the professor grabbed a lighter and lit it and it almost burned the building down. It was amazing. It was great. Why? Why? Because we will retain what we apply. Application is so much more significant than information. And today you've gotten a lot of information, but right here, I love what Pastor Matt Keller said last week. We have a moment to make our space an altar. And the altar is where we come to be altered. So here's the thing, I'm gonna pray for us. And as I pray for us, I wonder if you would make this moment a moment where you begin to get rid of some of the things that you don't need to take home with you. Can I tell you, there are things today that you can walk out of this door not carrying anymore. You can free up some space in the junk drawer and God will fill any space that you open up for.